This is Lessons of the 60s, a project of the Institute for Policy Studies. Today we are interviewing John Hanrahan in the offices of IPS. Anne Gallivan is the other interviewer. I'm Anka Decker. Our videographer is Russell Belcher. Today is June 2nd, 2016. John Hanrahan is a working journalist and a longtime local DC activist. Hi, John. Good afternoon. Good <laughs> Tell to be us here. about how you got here from, from the Midwest. Well, I, uh, I grew up in a little town. Well, it's about 25,000 for Iowa. That's a pretty big city, actually. And it was uh, born in 1938. And um, growing up, uh, it, was, uh, it was a town, although right in the heart of the agricultural belt, obviously, and a lot of farm implement stores, et cetera. There was also a fairly strong union presence. I probably wasn't that aware of it in my earlier years, but it was a, a meat packing, two uh, meat packing plants, Hormel's and one called Gus Glazer's, which uh, I uh, d discovered uh, later. Uh, first thing I found out really about union uh, work was during the summertime, I, was, I would work at the local newspaper in a variety of jobs, which I'll get to in a second, but my sister had a job as a fill-in uh, person in the uh, freezer, I think at Gus Glazer's during the summer, she was uh, unionized for that period of time while there were a lot of people were on vacation. And she was with overtime, and this is like 1958 or 59, she was bringing in $125 a week as a high school kid. I was at the newspaper was being paid 80 cents an hour, and when they took out for Social Security and that it was $28 an hour. So I sort of got a good uh, you know, monetary opinion of unions, I guess, at that point. But growing up, uh, my, I mean, I think it's probably relevant is uh, we did not come from a union background. My father was, uh, had been, he was much older than my mother. He died when I, uh, when I was 13 and he was uh, 75 and he was sick the last few years. So I didn't really know that much about his politics other than some of the books around the, the house which seemed to be tilted toward sort of Midwestern progressivism, you know, the Robert La Follette kind of republicanism that was prominent in the teens and the 20s. And um, my mother, though, was, was very conservative. And she uh, is always ironic. She really ran this plumbing supply company. I mean, she was the, you know, the secretary or assistant, but she really ran it. And uh, she was always complaining about all these union fellows, because at that time, what was it, Kohler? Kohler uh, Company of Wisconsin was on a 20-year strike or something. It was hard for getting parts. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm uh, during that uh, uh, period, I did work at the, the newspaper, and um, I worked in the sometimes in the composing room, sometimes in the press room, uh, sometimes uh, actually in the newsroom, and it, it just depended on the season of the year or what was what was going on. But I did get very familiar with what uh, people did in the press room, which becomes relevant later on for the Washington Post strike that I was involved in, because I always said I was probably the only uh, newspaper guild reporter who had actually worked in a press room. And the thing I remember about it the most was it was a very dirty and dangerous job. I mean, in the winter time, I can remember just having a cold blowing my nose and my handkerchief was just all black and I thought I didn't know anything about chemicals or much about it at that time I thought this can't be good you know, whatever <laughs> your job is inhaling this stuff all day long many of the pressmen had missing fingers or parts of fingers uh, uh, other injuries back injuries etc so it was uh, something I was uh, very familiar with and as uh, you know growing up then uh, I went to, first to a local uh, junior college for a couple of years and then to the uh, University of Iowa, uh, where I think I, my eyes were more open to uh, political things at, at that time, even coming from a pretty conservative uh, background. I uh, uh, came in contact with a lot of people there who were very active in doing things like desegregating the, uh, you know, picketing the Woolworths and local five and dime stores in, in sympathy with the uh, Southern uh, uh, picketing that was going on. And uh, there I did work on the Daily Iowa newspaper, was sports editor for a, a semester, I guess, and um, 
all sent back stories to the local paper, usually uh, on sports. That was, I, I covered the University of Iowa for the, uh, for the paper. But looming over all this all the time for any young man at the time was the, the military draft. And that was so much uh, on my, my mind all the time. What years uh, were these joined? Well, I was at the University of Iowa 58 to 60 after the, uh, after the two years at a junior college. And I remember once saying to my mother, I, I might as well just enlist and get it over with because they're going to draft me at some bad time. I wasn't thinking at all about um, you know, any further implications of it. Um, and um, so I, I went through the, the four years there. Uh, I mean, you, you just could not really make any, any plans. You thought, well, is it going to happen right when I graduate? Is it, am I going to work for a year and then be interrupted then? And what's going to happen? Well, to make a long story short, I did uh, uh, a year. I went to work for a newspaper in Davenport, Iowa. It's now called the Quad City Times. And um, I, was on the, I was a sports writer, assistant sports writer. That was what I was pursuing at the time was sports writing. And um, on my, the, the, I can't remember if it was the day before or the day of my 23rd birthday, I got a draft notice. And I felt like it wasn't really a very nice happy birthday present and uh, was drafted, uh, went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and then to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, worked in uh, public uh, information, as they called it then. And there, I'll, I won't bother talking about that, but there was the most interesting, fascinating, rebellious people in my life I met in the Army. Uh, they were just uh, in, incredible in, uh, in, their, in their politics. And we were in the office that was supposed to be you know, propagandizing for the Army. And everybody hated the Army, except for some lifers in there. So uh, I got out of there in uh, September of 1963, went back to uh, Iowa to work on the newspaper, but I, I told him I didn't really want to be uh, on sports anymore. It was entitled to my job back, uh, and I became sort of a political reporter, which was disillusioning at this particular paper because they basically ran the local Republican Party, and uh, you know, covering Democrats was just not in their uh, uh, interests. Yeah, so back in Davenport, after I got out of the Army, and uh, for a year, uh, I covered uh, a, n a number of things, but uh, uh, local uh, Republican and Democratic Party uh, stuff. I did this, even uh, managed to get some stories in this very conservative paper about the civil rights movement uh, locally, a three or four part uh, series. Uh, some really good, interesting uh, people there. But after about a year, and uh, as I mentioned about this, they the editor really ran the local Republican Party, and it was a Goldwater year, and he was not a Goldwater uh, person. But I mean, just to give you one example of, of how they ran the party, the mayor, the mayor was Republican. He came into the office one day. The county was Democratic, but the, the city was Republican. And our city hall reporter happened to be there, and the editor called him over and said, Jim, Jim, uh, Mayor Petroselli has something he'd like to uh, announce here. And so he, he gets his notebook and he starts taking notes and after about 30 seconds into it the editor says no 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 Don that's not the way you want to say it here's what you want to say and pretty soon the reporter taking notes from his editor as if it were the mayor you know and so that was sort of an example I just sort of got uh, fed up with that and then a lot of friends were uh, relocated to Washington and the, the only thing I'll say about it, I just so I just quit and came out here it was all very amicable and I keep saying that today I mean People would certainly do that, might quit a job, but I had no fear whatsoever. It wasn't that I thought I was so great, but jobs were just so damn plentiful. You could come here and get a job. You didn't, and I was also influenced by people who worked at uh, my newspaper in Davenport. They had worked you know, at six or seven papers around the country, and we're always saying, ah, now you can go to Washington, you'll get some sort of job there. And uh, so I, I came to Washington and um, uh, first uh, worked for the Montgomery County Sentinel, which is a which was a very good weekly newspaper, and one where Bob Woodward later uh, went also started out, and um, then t uh, after a year and a half there went to the Washington Star, and, and then in uh, 
1968 to the Washington Post, and mainly in both places I covered uh, suburban counties and the state legislature uh, a, a couple of times, uh, th I guess three legislative sessions down there. Uh, but So that was my, my primary thing. But in the meantime, I had, I had met a lot of really interesting local activists. Some of it was in part of my news uh, covering of things, but uh, others wasn't at all. And uh, a few people, Mike Tabor, who's involved in our project here, uh, I, you know, I can almost put the exact date, uh, April 19th, 1965, because it was two days after the uh, SDS anti-war uh, protest here in Washington, the first big anti-war protest. And Mike saw that I had this button, and he began talking to me, and the next thing I knew, I was involved in one of his uh, activities, which was something called the Action Coordinating Committee to End Segregation in the Suburbs, Access. And there were a lot of really good uh, people involved with that, too. A lot of picket lines in uh, suburban Maryland, suburban Virginia. Uh, and uh, uh, once I though, began working at some of these newspapers, I had to really uh, drop that. And I was when I was working for the Washington Star in this spring of 1966, I'm just going to name a few people during this. I, it, Maryland was having a, going to have a constitutional convention to rewrite their really uh, outmoded constitution that ran, I forget, 800,000 pages, one of the longest constitutions <laughs> ever. And uh, they were going to revise that. And so people were running as delegates. And I'm in the press room in Rockville, in Montgomery County, a couple other reporters there too. And in walked these two guys. Their combined weight must have been 700 pounds. It was, and uh, soon found out it was Brent and John Dillingham. And they were running for a constitutional convention. And John, uh, my wife Debbie later always said that John always looked like, sort of like he should have been a cardinal or something in the Middle Ages. I mean, he just had this, uh, he was very dignified. And Brent was more of a wild card. And, but together, they had the funniest routines. They would bounce off each other. One would say something serious about the Constitutional Convention, and the other one would have a little cutting jab. I mean, if, if one event in my life I could recreate, it would be that one. I just, he had all the reporters in stitches. They had all in stitches for a while. Brent became a, a, a friend of mine uh, uh, after that, and uh, I'll probably mention a couple of stories as we go along. but. Um, in, um, uh, so that would have been, in, so in 68, when I went to the, uh, the Washington Post, uh, three or four days, the last thing I covered for the Washington Star, uh, a Thursday night, uh, probably, probably was like the 17th of November, um, it was a meeting in Montgomery County of people who had been active, either for Eugene McCarthy or Bobby Kennedy, at the 1968 Democratic Convention, which of course nominated Hubert Humphrey. And they were trying to form some sort of progressive uh, organization. And uh, Brent was, was there and a lot of, you know, 150 other people, I suppose. And uh, afterwards Brent said, oh, some of us are going over to the uh, Tasty Diner. Uh, do you want to join us? And I said, sure. And so probably 15 or 20 people went over there and, uh, I was introduced at that time to uh, somebody named Debbie Barger, who I later married. She thinks we met on a picket line two months later, but Brent, if he were here today, he would be my witness on this, that he introduced us there. And uh, it, jumping ahead just a little bit on that score, Brent, three years later or so, we were, after we were married and we were in there, and Brent was in there, and he, the waitress uh, came over, and I reminded Brent just before she came over that, oh, this is where you introduced uh, Debbie to me, and, and the waitress came over. Brent was this great storyteller, flowery. He loved everything from the corny jokes. You know, he had, he, he read, you know, Reader's Digest jokes, which his brother jabbed him for one time, but <laughs> any Youngman jokes, uh, and uh, what do you call limerick, not limericks, uh, those kind of jokes, but, uh, and no, that was a hickory dackery doc, uh, you know, those kind of, what do you call those? I, mean, I don't know. Anyway, Brent, um, 
the waitress comes over and he said, I just want to tell you what a historic place this is for these two young people, talking in very flowery language, exaggerated language. And she's standing there with her pad. Uh, she's uh, I'm trying to remember if she was chewing gum or, or had a cigarette in her mouth, but she uh, listened patiently as he went on and on about these. And then these two young people, and he, two years later, they got married. and well, So this is a very significant place for them. And when he finally finished, she looked up and she said, oh, is that right? I met two of my husbands in here, too. And uh, Brett, of course, just roared. That was the perfect uh, comeback. Uh, he, the, the strange thing was, or the funny thing was, that Brent was in Chicago at the time of the 68 convention. Debbie was in Chicago. They were there with, uh, lobbying for uh, McCarthy, or at least Debbie was. I don't know about Brent. And they um, uh, subsequently in the movie Medium Cool, you see Debbie walking down the street. You catch a, a glimpse of Brent. But the funny thing was, I was covering the Maryland legislature at the time, and the Speaker of the House of Delegates was a guy named Thomas Hunter Lowe. Very straight arrow, very conservative, but not a, a closed-minded person by any means. Uh, he had gone to the convention. Debbie recalls that he was actually a McCarthy uh, supporter, but he got so fed up with the police uh, actions there, the police riot, uh, that he just went home and he gave his suite to uh, Debbie and Brent and some other people. I read about that in the Baltimore Sun uh, after he got back didn't know Debbie at all at the time, but he said, and then I gave my suite to these nice hippies. Well, I only found out probably a year later that these nice hippies were Brent and <laughs> Debbie and some other people. Uh, so it was sort of a, a funny uh, uh, thing. And then uh, subsequently, uh, I mean, as, as a reporter, I did cover a lot of things. I covered some of the great boycott uh, uh, protests because it was a suburban reporter. I, I can only remember out in Montgomery County, the Giant on whatever road that is there. Uh, I think Mike Tabor and others went in to act horrified that they were selling grapes and poured fake blood or something on the, on the grapes. Uh, so during that, that time, um, I mean, I was a reporter. I covered a number of events that certainly, uh, I shouldn't say like I was the only one, but there were, I was among a lot of people who were covering, uh, like the march on the, the Pentagon. I was there from the Washington Star. Uh, my favorite one, which Anne reminded me of uh, earlier, was uh, 1970, Honor America Day. Billy Graham and others were going to have this big event at the Lincoln Memorial in the morning, sort of a prayer, prayer service. And then that evening, there was going to be a nationally televised two-hour or three-hour, I don't know, extravaganza on uh, to uh, uh, this 4th of July weekend to celebrate the goodness of America. Everybody interpreted this as a Billy Graham support the war in Vietnam, support Nixon. It was, and it was definitely that's what it was. So in the morning, there's this ceremony at the Lincoln Memorial, and uh, they're up there on the stage, and you can see a lot of protesters or people gathering off in the, the distance. Uh, and then suddenly, I memory plays tricks on you. How many, how many people was it? That, was it 50? Was it 100? Of protesters went into the reflecting pool and began marching in the water toward the Lincoln Memorial. And some of them, as I, as I described, were sort of you know, Billy Graham's worst nightmare of what a <laughs> protester looked like, you know. Scraggly, you know, is really disheveled, everybody looking really bad <laughs> to his eyes. And as they're marching, and this thing is going on up there on the stage, and they're chanting, fuck Billy Graham, fuck Billy Graham. And, and the park police are there on their horses, and the poor horses, because the water is spilling out onto the pavement, the poor horses are slipping and sliding. They have to get off their horses to pull the people out of there which they eventually do, or people just scattered before being arrested. Uh, in later years, I've looked, for the official, I've looked at the official film that's on some website of that event, and they, you don't hear a sound of fuck Billy Graham or anything else on there. 
Uh, then that evening, to make matters even stranger, uh, so it's Bob Hope is, is uh, the master of ceremonies for this show, and they've got this, it's, they've set up a stage down there in the mall, and uh, so nobody can, is really going to go in there and protest or anything, but there's a lot, hundreds of people gathered outside to, uh, to chant and protest, and the police have sort of got the area cordoned off. And meanwhile, there's, you know, 250,000 people who are there to see the fireworks that are going to come after this show. So they're, the police, some of them were all, it's almost like a circle. They were in the middle of this circle, and somebody or, or two somebodies threw a bottle in there, and the police suddenly just unleashed tear gas. And people just started running. You know, there's 200,000 people on the, and people with little kids and that. You could see people picking up babies and kids and running. I'm running off. And meanwhile, you can hear them on the stage with this program coming. And I said, I said to people later, you know, if some leftist had devised this as some sort of propaganda piece, they couldn't have done it better because and we want to, now this is the new Christie Minstrels, and we want to tell you, we've been going all over this great country of ours, and wherever we go, people always want to hear this song, this land is your land, and the tear gas is flying, and all these, and it's, but to make a long story short, none of that went into the Washington Post the next day. I called it in, none of that appeared. Uh, the fuck Billy Graham stuff didn't appear in the story that was written, with, the, with which I was one of the bylines on it. Uh, Follow up to that, uh, Carl Bernstein, Aaron Latham, and I all demanded to talk to some editors about why we were not reporting things that went on at this demonstration. And uh, there was a, a guy who was managing editor, I guess at the time, Eugene Patterson. And uh, among others, we met with him. And he said, Well, you know, he actually said, You know, millions of people saw this show on. TV and they didn't see any of that. And we said, but this isn't the reality of what happened. There, was, there were clashes down there. People got tear gassed. Thousands of people know they were tear gassed. You know, it's sort of, uh, it, it didn't, uh, didn't uh, do any good. Um, but so those were some of the events that we uh, uh, were that I remember covering, but there were a lot of a lot of others too. But those were that involved uh, activists certainly. Um, 1972. I suppose we couldn't have uh, picked a, a worse uh, year for it. But Debbie and I, I got a leave of absence from the Washington Post, and we traveled for a year overland from London to India, Nepal, back again, uh, Morocco fifth class on a Turkish boat, which meant at night the sexes were separated, you got no blankets or slept on a... Anyway, it was a very interesting uh, trip all around. Then, uh, and during the course of it, of course, we picked up and saw what soon became the Watergate scandal. I immediately said, John Mitchell. Debbie immediately said, Chuck Colson, because she had known Colson from some job she had way back when. And uh, so we were both sort of right on that. Um, and could see from afar that, you know, we see the Woodward and Bernstein stories and were, you know, really uh, enthusiastic about that. And we voted uh, absentee in London for Eugene McCarthy. And of course then flying back, we were flying into Boston, so there were people from George Ma McGovern. What did I say? McCarthy, yes. George McGovern, yes. And we were flying back to uh, Boston and everybody on the plane was either from Massachusetts or the few of us from the District of Columbia who had all voted for George McGovern. We were the only jurisdictions <laughs> in the country that had. So we had this sort of sense of unreality for several days until we finally uh, got back to, to uh, D.C. And um, uh, so uh, during this period of time, the Washington Post from, I think it was 1971, Catherine Graham, the publisher, decided to take the company public. It had always been a family-owned enterprise. And part of the, uh, what that meant was shareholders. You're responsible for shareholders, as she said, maximizing that bottom line. 
and part and she even made speeches in which she said we have certain I forget what she called them intractable or she used some word problems and that includes the union uh, the unions the wages they the post as later even they reported uh, starting I think about 1971 began sending their senior personnel and non-union personnel to something whose initials were the SPPI Southern Production something uh, company to train them in the event of a strike. They had been used in other uh, strikes around the country, uh, essentially as we later turned to the school for scabs you would create uh, so that when the, if people go out and strike, you can keep operating. And that plus some incidents uh, with the, the Pressman's Union, which was the most militant and sort of the pace setting union for the, uh, in the building, they were the ones who got uh, the uh, cost of living wages, uh, some additional uh, pension uh, benefit, uh, profit sharing, which doesn't exist anymore. I'm sorry. Is that button uh, from the Pressman's Union? Uh, this was actually when the strike, yeah, when there was this, the, this, the strike. What's it yeah. say? It says, uh, defend the Pressman. I think I have it on ups. No, I don't have it on upside down. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, uh, the, there had been one incident that, um, where um, one of the uh, printers, the people who did set the, the type, I mean, that was a, a job that I had had in high school too. I didn't set the type, but I, I shoveled metal into a pot which poured out these little metal pigs, as they called them, which then went to the linotype machines. And anyway, these were uh, one of, they had, they had staged a walkout and the pressmen were out too then. This was about 1971, I guess. And um, the uh, Post, I believe, said they were going to, I forget what they, exactly what they said, but they, they were issuing warnings about, they, were, they, were, they had some people they thought could operate the, the presses with the pressmen out. So Jimmy Dugan, the president of the Pressmen's Union, went and told them, we're going back in. But they went back in only to sit down and not do anything, causing the post to have to negotiate with the printers over over a, a, a grievance that had come up immediately. So that, but that set very sat very badly with management. 1974, in one of the most Keystone Cops labor actions ever, my newspaper guild, of which I was a member, staged instead of a strike, stage a what they were calling withholding of excellence. And the notion was uh, once people, they didn't ask the other unions to support it, we just all went out. And it was uh, no byline, you know, so they wouldn't, people wouldn't, we were, uh, it was such an egotistical thing, you know, people are going to miss those bylines, you know, they're going to really rise up and revolt when they don't see that byline by so and so. And the, they were able, the post manager was able to keep what looked like a normal paper day in and day out uh, with wire stories, you know, some by editors. Uh, uh, it sort of looked like the post generally. They had all the columnists, et, et cetera, et cetera. And, and people in the guild just panicked and also got very upset with the, the head of the local union. That's all important because once the, uh, you know, I went to work on September 30th, 1975, and that was to be my last day at the Washington Post. The next day, I got a call in the morning that uh, don't come into work yet. There's going to be a meeting of the guild unit at the Post to decide what to do about this strike. And um, from the, the pressman strike. Press, I'm sorry. Yes, the pressman had walked uh, had walked out at midnight, and as we were to read about interminably from then on had quote unquote damaged the presses. So that was that not true? Of it. Was, not, was not true, but it, it was uh, the truth catching up with it was, and of course none of us even knew that, that first day what the heck was going on. The, the Post later in stories uh, and, and then the lawsuit they filed created the impression they filed a, a $15 million damage suit, which of course they were saying was also covered not being able to publish a couple of days. but. Uh, Basically, what the pressmen did, or some of them did, was, as, the, as an indictment against them later said, removed former noses. I always thought that was, even the head of the union, Jimmy Dugan, thought that was always a funny, former noses. It's a, 
it's a, like a nose cone that somehow is part of the process where the newspapers come out and get folded properly, as I understand it anyway. They remove those, and the problem is once you remove those, you can't start up the presses. You could cause great damage, uh, apparently. But no damage was really caused, but the presses were inoperable at that point. Uh, subsequently, and I'll maybe jumping ahead a little bit, a uh, guy from Channel 5, uh, whose report I happened to find this morning, a guy named Roy Meacham, instead of just taking the Post's word for it a couple of weeks after this strike started, he called the Goss Company in Illinois, which manufactures presses and parts for presses, where the Post would get its replacement parts. And uh, he was told by a guy there who was not sympathetic to the pressman at all, he was told, and he named him by name in the report, that the replacement parts that the Post ordered cost about $12,000. So instead of millions of dollars of damage, $12,000 of replacement parts was really the thing. Granted, they didn't publish for a couple of days, uh, but then they, let me just see if I happen to have that one. They had, uh, they had as I said, they were all prepared by going to this school for, for scabs. They managed somehow to be able to land helicopters on the roof of the Washington Post, even though this was in the, uh, what do you call it, pattern, the White House, you're not supposed to be flying helicopters there at any event. They, they printed uh, off-site, the Guild, I should jump back to that meeting, the Newspaper Guild, it was, it was a horrendous meeting because everybody was saying these are, you know, they damage the presses, the very lifeblood of a democracy and blah, 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 blah. And I didn't know anything at the time, but I knew that I wasn't going back to work. And uh, they, um, and I can't remember if it was that meeting, I think it was a subsequent meeting where this one reporter for the style section, and this sort of, to me, set the tone of part of what the strike was all about. Uh, he referred to, we've got nothing in common with these people. We're, you know, we're the reporters, forgetting that the Newspaper Guild includes people from adver classified advertising, display advertising, national advertising. Reporters were actually probably a minority in it, but they were the ones who uh, controlled things. And they said, we're, we have nothing in common with these people. And this one guy referred to them as slack-jawed cretins who destroyed our presses. It was so class, you know, um, vilifying, if you if you will. And um, so the initially, the I remember is sabotage. Pardon me. They, the, yeah. Oh, they, they, when you they read hit, the stories, it was hit, they sabotage. They the hit press. hard. Yes, yeah. they hit hard on that. Uh, and uh, and the the post also when they wrote about the strike, of course, it's like. A.G. Liebling's thing about the, you know, the uh, uh, f free presses belongs to anyone who owns one, and that was sort of the case in that, that strike. Well, uh, so I went out on strike. There were very few, if any, other reporters out at that point. Um, John, there were a lot during of, that meeting, mm -hmm. were you able to, to, to answer this guy's... Uh, I, at that first meeting, I knew nothing. I came in completely cold, I expect, and the head of the uh, newspaper guild, the local executive director, did not give, he gave a terrible presentation, didn't try to address any of those issues uh, at all. Uh, and it was, you know, in the midst of this crisis, people just said, I'm going to believe what I'm hearing from the, the, the management side of things. So, and, as time went on, more people came out more, as I discovered right away, there were a lot of classified uh, and uh, display ad people who were out, some of whom I, most of whom I didn't know. Um, I remember, I, do you remember Suzanne Groff, by any chance? She worked at the Post then, I didn't, and she was in advertising, and she's a big activist. But anyway, um, as time went on, and I talked to more and more people, more people uh, came out and we subsequently fall, uh, formed a, a strike support committee and put out a lot of flyers uh, to the people directed primarily to our guild members who were crossing the, the picket line. And meanwhile, this was just causing awful repercussions throughout. The, there was the Baltimore Washington Newspaper Guild was the local. The Post was a unit of that. 
and the um, that's the Baltimore Sun and the Washington Star, and I forget some of the other Bureau of National Affairs, various other organizations that had members. There was a vote of the local, which was overwhelmingly in support of the strike, but the post unit, it was overwhelmingly the other way, and it was and it caused a great split and almost lost certification for the post unit. They almost decertified themselves in favor of a of a company union. But as this, this strike went on, it it and we found out more and more. We began putting out things about the the Goss Company. One of our members called the Goss Company too, and uh, a guy named um, what is his name? I'm trying to remember his first. Lou Duga. He always talked about his his name was an acronym. You know, not an acronym. What do you call it? A homonym? No, it's a it same way spelled spelled the same antonym? way frontwards and backwards. What's that? Is it an antonym? No. Nah. We need some English lessons right. here. Anyway. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he confirmed that too. And we had a lot of, uh, uh, I, I did draw on my limited press room experience to say I was a dirty and dangerous job and that the post, that this wasn't an issue of, of money really at all. It was an issue of control of the press room. They could pretty much assign, you know, the post would say, we need X number of people Saturday night and the uh, union could assign those, those people. And the post wanted to take over. They said they were, there, was, there were too many people. They wanted to cut back the manning of, of, on the different shifts. Uh, they wanted to, uh, uh, that, that was the primary thing really, was uh, control of the, the, the press room and no, knocking out a lot of permanent jobs, making them floaters so that they could be called in at, at will. I always said in later years that people always hark back to the air traffic controller strike under Reagan. Catherine Graham and company set the template for future uh, strikes of, of that sort, how management would, would handle them. So we had a number of other meetings of the Guild Unit in the leading up to, say, early December of 1975, and we kept getting closer on a vote. The, the, the next to the last one we had was, we were probably within 40 or 50 votes in a, with 700 people voting, uh, th and we. People, we would talk to people crossing the picket line, and some of them, you know, said they were very sympathetic, blah blah blah. And, and certain ones of them, I can remember to this day, saying, "If she brings in replacement workers, um, that's when I'll come out. That's that's crossed a line." And of course, then the post announced that it was going to bring in replacement workers, and we had another vote. We were suddenly optimistic, and we got creamed in that boat too. Some of those people who said, mm -hmm. "Don't uh, you worry, I'll be with you when this happens." Interestingly enough, some people came out at that point because, who did say, and some we didn't even uh, know. The Post had made a, a, a big thing before about that there were very few black members of the Pressman's Union. Of course, the Post could did, Pressman's Union didn't have sole discretion to hire people by any means. But, and there was one black reporter who was out with us, uh, Richard Prince. And then after that vote, after the company said they were gonna bring in scabs, then Austin Scott, who was a national reporter, he came out. We had uh, just, I, I only wanna do this because I've it's, uh, mentioned a few names of people that uh, just so they're Heroism gets recorded. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Becker, Louis Duguid, who was the one who, D I U G U I D, backwards and forwards, uh, Barbara Bright Sanier, uh, Tom Grubasich, Richard Homan, Bill Mackay, who was the religion editor, and the father of punk legend Ian Mackay. Mackay, <laughs> I'm sorry, Mackay. Mackay. Um, Terry Shaw, but a lot of a lot of really, some people I knew beforehand, some I didn't, and I was it was very uh, heartening to see that. In any event, people started going back in after that. A lot of people held out until uh, January, February. Uh, meantime, the Pressmen's Union was being subjected to a grand jury investigation in the midst of the strike. The U.S. Attorney Earl Silbert of Watergate infamy, not, he didn't crack the case, he almost blew the case, 
Um, launched a grand jury investigation. 90 to 100 pressmen were summoned before the grand jury. This is in the middle of the strike. Imagine trying to run an effective strike while you're also being called before the grand jury. The Post would have stories, pressman's head takes fifth, not ever really pointing out that, you know, you have a right to take the Fifth Amendment. There's nothing, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, criminal about doing that. The investigation dragged on for a couple of years. They indicted 15 pressmen, felony charges. That kept hanging over. Then it became sort of a support the, the pressmen effort. One pressman committed suicide. Uh, there were uh, families that uh, lost their homes, lost their cars, lost you know whatever savings they had. They were getting minuscule. I mean. They were getting no real support from the AFL, CIO, uh, or from, I'd say, the, uh, their, inter their national or international union. How did it happen that they weren't getting support from the AFL, CIO? What was going on there? I, um, I think part of it was buying into the post propaganda and saying this is just too much of a, a you know, instead of sort of saying, even if it did occur, we're standing behind them, even if there was, but it wasn't even true. I mean, I, I had no great respect for George Meany and those folks. And I won't really mention the name, but Catherine Graham had her New Year's Day party that year, at which some labor union people of, of national stature attended. It was sort of like this access thing. We've got, as I point out, up until, if anybody can tell me since that strike in 1975, any article or editorial, particularly editorial, supporting a union any place other than, say, Poland. <laughs> as long as it's outside the United States, the Post is all for workers' rights. In the United States, I don't know what they said about Verizon. I, I, I didn't even read. Maybe they had something about the recent uh, Verizon strike. Probably not sympathetic. But I always said for a long time, that I'll, I'll buy you a chocolate shake at the Trio restaurant if you can point to an editorial and support of, of unions. Sometimes they'd have one of those, even the unions, even the unions support something that they were supporting. But uh, it was, uh, uh, so at, at some point in So they were 1970s, isolated. Yeah, I'd say they were very isolated and with the grand jury investigation uh, hanging over them. And they, but they drew a fairly good amount of community support, a lot of activist uh, organizations that uh, got involved in it. Um, uh, I know when we <laughs> interviewed Jimmy Dugan, who was the head of the, uh, the pressman, uh, there was a time when he, he and, and Fred Soloway, who was uh, an activist who took up the uh, union's cause and was really invaluable in, in, as a support person. We earlier mentioned about Irv Riskin, who was a veteran of labor fights, veteran uh, uh, Communist Party member uh, uh, all around the incredible guy. People like that uh, uh, came into it, but um, Dugan said, I used to always have to go to Fred when we were going to have a march and say, now, who are the good communists and who are the bad <laughs> communists? Which ones do we want to put in the rear? I don't quite understand all these different groups that have emerged. Uh, uh, but there were, there were a lot of organizations, and uh, Josephine Butler, who was a very big statehood uh, activist, wonderful community organizer, uh, joined in. There was a there was a lot of support, but not enough, and not enough uh, people really you know, depended on the the post. To, they had to now the city council of the District of Columbia refused to talk to post reporters during the strike. I mean, you can imagine a whole group of politicians refusing to talk to the Post, but most of them had come out of the Civil Rights Movement. They had more of a sense of solidarity and uh, did not, uh, uh, so there, you know, there were a lot of good signs. Eventually, all those felony charges disappeared. Some pleaded guilty to misdemeanors. One guy did go to uh, jail who had, for an, on an assault charge, separate and apart from the um, press room incident, he had uh, slugged a reporter <laughs> coming out of the, the post and he was convicted. So then the union essentially went away and since then, uh, I mean I couldn't tell you in recent times, but the, the Newspaper Guild was not amply rewarded um, 
in, in the aftermath. It took them a few years to get a, a contract. It was, it was weakened, too. They almost tried to decertify people, rescinded their memberships, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually it built uh, uh, back up again. Uh, but, but over the years, they've had uh, different uh, problems. I have no idea what it's uh, like today. But I did get, I, in 19, probably March or so, 76, my boss, who I got along with very well, called and said, what, what's, what do you think? Are you going to be coming back in? I said, Herb, I'm afraid I won't be. Who is that, John? That was uh, Herb Denton. He's since died. He died about 1985 or so. He was the only black editor at the paper at the time. Because uh, I often said when people said, the Pressman's Union is mostly what? I said, we don't have any black editors, and you guys and me, we've just, what, have we been out there agitating for that? No, we have not. Let's, let's not be hypocritical about this. But Herb, just one funny diverting story that they, there were lawsuits filed by uh, black reporters and by women reporters. These suits were hanging over them, so Bradley, Ben Bradley was under pressure to rectify this, and Herb, my boss, one day said that he and Bradley were going on a recruiting trip. Now, I'm a Maryland report. I, mean, I was a Maryland editor at the time. And so I said, oh, that's really good. And I, I said, uh, well, uh, and he said, yeah, we're going to be going to uh, up to Cam Cambridge. And as a Maryland reporter, I thought, Cambridge, Maryland. And I said, well, Herb, there are a lot of black people in Cambridge, Maryland, but there's like no college there that's going to be turning out journalists or anything. He said, no, Cambridge. Massachusetts, Harvard. And I said, oh, Harvard, <laughs> yeah. So at a, at a news conference I attended shortly thereafter, now knowing that Harvard was located in Cambridge, <laughs> Massachusetts, Bradley mentioned that he was, they were going on this recruiting trip to Harvard. And one of the other editors, I mean, it wasn't me, he just said, why aren't we going to Harvard? Why aren't we going to traditional black colleges? Why aren't we going to state universities? Actually, Glenn Downey, his successor, was always big on he had gone to Ohio State, so he was big on State University. And Bradley said, oh, they're on such a faster track up there. So that was where the emphasis was going to uh, be. But uh, come right around July 4th, somewhere the mail, right before then, I got notice that I was being terminated. And I wrote back saying, you know, um, I forget. I, I was bluffing my way on labor law. I said, but you know, you can't really uh, fire me for being on support of the strike. They sent me another letter then that said uh, I could reapply for my job <laughs> if I wanted to. So I guess that's still an open, uh, <laughs> open offer. I don't know. Uh, in the, um, so from, from then on, as I think I mentioned when we were off camera about uh, you know, checkered uh, career, I did have an interview uh, some friends at the Baltimore Sun arranged for me with the guy who was with the publisher's son, or I forget what their name was, Schmick? I can't remember what, in any event, the close of the interview, he asked me, well, you know, we, our newspaper guild represents over here, now, if there were a strike here at the Baltimore Sun, would you support that strike, knowing what you know now? And I said, oh, absolutely. And I thought it was an Im improper question to ask, but I didn't get any uh, sort of job, which I, I heard some feedback later that that was the wrong answer. <laughs> Uh, so I, I had, uh, I did some work for AFSCME, uh, the Union American Federation of State County Municipal Employees. What kind of work? Well, I wrote a thing. I wish I'd had the uh, foresight to call it privatization as developed under Reagan, but it was contracting out of government uh, services, primarily at the federal, and, I mean the state and local level, but also talking about at the, the federal level and um, worked, uh, I won't run through all of this, but I, I had various jobs. I did work for United Press International, Common Cause Magazine. Uh, I always said United Press International, they, I, I started there just about the time they were starting to lay off people for the umpteenth time. And I always said that the most enjoyable newspaper uh, journalism jobs I ever had, I think, were at the Washington Star and at UPI which were both failing enterprises, <laughs> and I had nothing to do with it. I didn't cause their demise. But uh, why so was that? The, it was a looser atmosphere. It was. It was. It was a much looser atmosphere. The Star, in some ways, on their 
post was over edited at the time I was there. The star was under edited, so writers could write more, but you sometimes wish they'd look a little closer when you made some <laughs> error and would catch it. But no, it was a much looser atmosphere. They would, they would, on Saturday, uh, they, they always seemed to have overstaffed at the Washington Star. I had sometimes a day off in the middle of the week, and people would go out for dinner, large group, to Mr. Henry's, just, just open on Capitol Hill. Then would come back and some of them would say, let's raid the editor's offices. And they would break into some of the offices, like the book editors, and just scoop up <laughs> hundreds of books. I mean, art books, everything else. They would do, and, I, and later at the Post, I thought, they would never do, they would be fired for that, probably. They would be, it would be an inquiry, a Spanish Inquisition of some sort. They, they just, they were just a much looser group, and with some great, you know, great journalists there, uh, too. Um, but so, yeah, so that was, uh, and, I, and I wrote a couple of books. I was the executive director of the Fund for Investigative Journalism, uh, and I was a, a private investigator for a period of time, uh, quite a, a couple of different shifts on that. And um, I, I know there's stuff I should have included or haven't, in, uh, or... Tell us about your books. Uh, two... The first book was um, also in the line of uh, government contracting, but this was for an uh, independent uh, thing. But well, the first one was actually called Lost Frontier, The Marketing of Alaska. It was done with a guy named Peter Grunstein, who subsequently moved to Alaska. I thought I'd be the one who'd moved to Alaska. Peter moved there. Um, that was really uh, on the advance, I mean, there was a before we got an advance on it, Ralph Nader underwrote that. Essentially, he was paying uh, for that. Till, and it got very good reviews. Um, who was the guy's name? Robert Coles interviewed, reviewed it in the Washington Post and gave it a good review in the Washington Post, my nemesis. However, it came out at exactly the same time as a beautiful, wonderful book by John McPhee of The New Yorker, <laughs> who wrote this lyrical, rhapsodical thing where mine was about, you know, the forces that were contending for the future of Alaska. I mean, he dealt with some of that too, but he was, his was much, a much better book, needless to say. But, uh, so it was, but I got to meet a lot of people in Alaska. I didn't get to spend enough time there. It's funny, in later, in a later camp, my co-author, Peter Grunstein, subsequently moved to Alaska he was a lawyer. He subsequently got a job in the Attorney General's office. He then ran for Congress as a Democrat against Don Young, which is a hopeless thing. Young had a stranglehold on that state, like a, always wins 80 to 20 or 70 to 30. So Peter was running against But I get a call one day from a reporter at the Anchorage Daily News saying, um, about this chapter in here about marijuana in Alaska, Wondering who wrote that chapter? Was that you or Peter? Well, the thing was, I was I stayed for a time at a state legislator's home, and there had been a court decision that said you could use marijuana in your own home. And the various legislators came over. They're all young legislators, and they were all smoking pot there. And, the, and I knew that one of the attorney generals, and I didn't name anybody in it, but I just said, this was just part of the Alaska scene. That I said, even state legislators, said, nobody wears a tie except this guy owned this terrible, one of the terrible papers there. And uh, it was just sort of the description. But the overall implication was, this is pretty neat they do this in Alaska. And somebody, I suppose, Young's people were saying, well, he's writing this thing about encouraging drug use, and he's worked for the attorney general's office, and what's all this about? And, so I had to say it was really my chapter, and it was. But I called Peter to say they're asking about that, and there was another thing they asked about too. Oh, I know it was it was something environmental, and Peter had trimmed his sails environmentally because of the powerful uh, energy uh, forces up there. And uh, fortunately, I was able to say, yeah, that was all the stuff that I that I wrote. Um, but. Anyway, that's really off the subject. But the other book was about uh, government, con it was called Government, uh, government by Contract. And it was uh, um, uh, 
The one on Alaska. The one in Alaska actually sold a lot of books in Alaska. But I'd like to ask you about your local activism that you've done in the succeeding years. You and Debbie and State uh, Labor Party and uh, yeah, Rights. yeah. I mean, um, since the, the Statehood Party was founded in 1971 by uh, Julius Hobson and others, and he was the, one of the as Sam Smith said, if he had been known more nationally, he was one of the great civil rights leaders, uh, an incredible person. And I've been a registered statehood, now statehood Green Party member since then, as has as Debbie was one of the original uh, uh, signers. And um, so there's been a lot of uh, different issues, particularly after I've more or less retired from full-time jobs. As I said, I was sort of a full-time uh, intern uh, but on different projects relating to, some of it's on a national level, but on a local level, it has been more uh, on issues of uh, public uh, property being turned over to private interests at, for, for nothing or for a, a great benefit to the private interests. Some uh, examples? Some examples. Well, the, um, uh, I'm, I preface this by saying I am a great baseball fan, but we were dead set against public financing for a baseball stadium. The whole notion, now a soccer stadium for the richest guy in Indonesia, kicking in 150 million. A lot of the, the stadium uh, uh, giveaways that, uh, uh, I saw some article today even where the council member who was the most gung-ho for that said, see, it was a success. Nobody ever said that we couldn't have a baseball team or that we couldn't have a stadium. It was just, why, does, why is the public paying all this, uh, this money for it? So there were uh, issues that currently on McMillan Reservoir, McMillan Park, which is another uh, giveaway to developers. So a lot of those uh, kinds of uh, issues um, over, over the years. Statehood has now come back up again. Uh, the mayor is, is pushing it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been one that we've been worked on for a, a long time, more, more in the earlier years, I'd say, than, than now, though. Um, so it's, uh, what, what else should I be talking about? What are the prospects for statehood? What, what are the what? Prospects for D.C. statehood. Um, it's very funny. Right now, the, the mayor sort of blindsided everybody on this. The, the mayor and council members generally have never been that enthusiastic about it because they suddenly see that it's going to water down their uh, position. Um, people who have been working on this have gotten 130 sponsors of stated legislation in the House and 20-some in the Senate, including ones from Maryland and Virginia, which had always been difficult because of the issue of a commuter tax possibly being imposed. Right as they're making this sort of headway, the mayor last or in May, I guess, of this year, 2016, uh, said, we've been working, we, uh, a statehood commission of five members, of which she is one of the members, on a draft constitution. Well, lo and behold, the draft constitution mirrors exactly what the Home Rule Charter is with 13 state legislators. Lo and behold, and we have 13 council members. And no lieutenant governor, because there's only one you know, she would be the, the governor to uh, a lot of objectionable things in this, but sort of putting people over a barrel of, and putting it on a fast timetable, no constitutional convention, but rather two days of testimony where hundreds of people will testify and be next witness, next witness, not really drafting a new uh, constitution. So, and it all really depends on, on Congress. And Democrats, when they've been in power, have not shown any great leadership or inclination to do anything about this. The last time there was a vote, 1993, there actually was a statehood vote. And there was, I forget how many, it was something like 153 in favor and the 300 or 280 against. Uh, and uh, I think prospects are not great. Um, but we're getting better. I mean, I think <laughs> the, the people who are out getting sponsors on the Hill have done a fantastic job, but that would all be pushed to the side under the, the mayor's uh, plan, which would be you, uh, uh, that you submit this document to Congress, Congress votes on it, and then you, uh, I'm, I shouldn't even go into it, it's too 
complicated, but I'm, I'm, a lot of people who are supporting Sadie are very annoyed by what she's doing because it's this quick timetable of get it on the ballot by November and take it or leave it constitution, you know, rather than working on it. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm... I'd DC has a population like a lot of other states. Uh, right? Larger than a couple of other states yeah. and um, Wyoming and what is it? Utah? Is it yeah, Utah? Yeah, uh, Rhode Island. I'm trying to remember, it used, it used to be larger than Alaska too. Alaska's population fluctuates. But uh, anyway, that the, the, the strike at the Washington Post, as we said at the time, was sort of uh, uh, like got stuff where we even were writing at the time, this is going to be a bellwether strike. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to, you know, unions are in trouble. Uh, if, and if the so-called liberal newspaper can get away with this, they can get away with it uh, any place and without fear of being criticized in that same press. And we, uh, at the, the time, there was one thing I forgot to mention that at some point when it looked like the strike was really done for, there's two important things. I'm sorry, I'm running over here. The, that the, the Newspaper Guild went back to work. Some of us who were still staying out talked to the uh, Jimmy Dugan and the union people and said, we're going to try to drum up an ad to run in the Washington Star calling upon both parties to get back to the negotiating table. Catherine Graham had said that was a final offer. The pressman voted down the final offer like 250 to 2 or something like that, even in the face of losing their, their jobs. Uh, so we got this uh, ad in which, uh, signed by members of the city council, it was signed by people like Hubert Humphrey and George McGovern and all the sort of liberal uh, uh, establishment politicians, uh, uh, the uh, Father Higgins, the Monsignor Higgins, the labor priest, very well known, all kinds of people just calling upon both parties to get back to the negotiating table. The union, of course, said yes, since they were in cahoots with us, and the Post didn't bother to respond. And so going on into January, I remember Eugene O'Sullivan, one of the uh, striking pressmen, he and his brother Jim were really outstanding people, very knowledgeable politically on all levels. And he said, you know Donnie Graham, don't you, Catherine Graham's son? I said, yeah, he, you know, he worked in the newsroom for a while, and yeah. And he said, what do you think about you you know, going to lunch with him and saying, what are the prospects? Can we do something here? And so I cleared with Dugan and some of the others, and I met Donnie Graham for dinner. Where? At some place that doesn't, it, what was it? Right near the post, 16th and, uh, 16th and K? Is there a hotel that had some restaurant that had like pseudo, South American drinks or something. I don't remember what it was. Uh, anyway, uh, so we met and it was just like we were talking past each other. When I would say things, yeah, so I uh, met uh, Donald Graham for dinner and we were just sort of talking past each other because at one point I, I remember saying to him that as reporters we would put ourselves in the position of thinking we could cover any kind of person, whether it's uh, uh, a Donald Trump type person or a, a mother on welfare, somebody who's out working in the grape field, somebody who's working in a normal office job, et cetera, et cetera. And that what the strike had indicated to me was this huge gap between uh, the, the reporters and blue collar workers in this particular case and no uh, understanding of who they were, just seeing them as people who just work at the newspaper and they're not as good as we are. And, uh, and I said, because it was in the aftermath, you know, a few years before Agnew had been criticizing the press st stupidly, uh, but he had, uh, I, I said, the only thing that, I said, there is this sort of growing elite among newspaper people that can become separate from others. His response was really, you know, that's so true. We get so many, you'd be amazed at all the people we get applying here now with advanced degrees and with, and from the best schools in the country. And I thought, well, that's sort of, I'm not saying that's the problem, but don't you think you should have a little bit of a mix? I mean, when you think about 
Carl Bernstein, who, by the way, crossed the picket line and was anathema to all of us, didn't go to college. He didn't finish college. I don't even remember if he went. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it didn't seem to hurt his early reporting career <laughs> anyway. Uh, and there were a number of other uh, people like that in all kinds of, but so it, it was, the, but his answer was, no, we're not going to, those people are gone. I, I, you know, I told about the, the hardships they were undergoing, you know, didn't, didn't bat an eye, and that was uh, sort of the last uh, contact I had with them. In the meantime, the Post was still writing about this. They had a number of stories, I think, as I mentioned earlier, about propagandizing how much the damage was done to the presses. Uh, they, they had a story, one, I mentioned that one of the pressmen had committed suicide. They had a tiny story which made it appear like it was, he was unhappy with the union. I mean, I could quote from it, but it was really a despicable uh, story. And I later interviewed his wife, and she's completely opposite, and, and Congressman Conyers actually put that article in the, uh, in the congressional record. Uh, we, had, we did have some s supporters, as I said, in, in Congress for whatever that did, and, they, and who were refusing to talk to the Post uh, during that time. Uh, I had mentioned, this is not going to be visible on screen, I had mentioned the, the ad we put in urging them to get back to the uh, bargaining table. And you'll see labor leaders on here. Uh, you'll see the old timers will remember Martin Nagronsky, TV commentator, a whole bunch of uh, Congress members, including one Debbie had worked for uh, Yvonne Braithwaite Burke, um, David Clark of the uh, D.C. City Council, uh, some Maryland state legislatures, uh, legislators. Um, uh, I was looking for some of the really fun, uh, Donal Lease, the uh, musician. Um, trying to remember who the weather, there were people who did the weather on TV who had supporters. Anyway, it was a really impressive uh, group of people and that didn't do anything to move the post. And one of the things that we did, a uh, big brochure which, uh, Chip Burley, who was also very active in the strike, I should be mentioning his name, Sam Pizzagatti, who was actually a fellow here at IPS, uh, and I put uh, this together. Chip was sort of in charge of the uh, publicity uh, committee, if you will, and we would have these meetings where, as I said, different factions of different political groups all wanted to be on the committee. They didn't want to do any work, but they wanted to be on the committee. And Chip was very good at saying, you all can go have a drink later and discuss all these finer points of, of, uh, of, of Marxism or Leninism, but we've got to get out a flyer here. And this was one of, uh, I don't remember whose idea this was, but this was sort of a, a masterpiece of, again, you won't be able to read it, but holding up. We took all the post stories, or at least parts of them, and like edited them for errors and uh, so it shows the editing marks. shows the editing marks on here. Uh, it, uh, like, uh, let me see if I can read one of them here. The no notorious press room violence turned out to be minor vandalism, see below. And every person who's ever been on strike knows that a first day's picket line is ordinarily the most difficult to keep disciplined. And then it goes into describing the, the, the replacement parts only cost... Uh, $12,000. Uh, uh, and here's this one headline, post named Seven Pressmen Union in $15 million suit. I would get the impression from that that, boy, they really wrecked that place, didn't they? And then Pressmen's Union Chief Takes Fifth. Uh, and in, anyway, it all, it was all very, uh, and I, I once uh, stopped both Leonard Downey, who was not, he was then a, a higher up editor, but later was to become editor, saying how awful their coverage was, as if he hadn't heard that from people before. But, and, and Bob Kaiser, who wrote most of these articles, you know, an esteemed national reporter. And uh, I mean, I could not imagine any reporter saying, yes, I want to write on the strike for the paper that I'm crossing the picket line on. And these, these stories were terribly uh, biased, uh, needless to say. Are you saying Leonard Downey edited those stories? I, I don't know he if he was editing those stories. Ed, Leonard, uh, uh, of course, was once he came back. He had been on a year's leave of absence in 1972. He became a, eventually sort of a assistant Watergate person, so he had been handling 
a, a lot of that. And he, I don't remember what his, if he was, if his title then was Metropolitan Editor, probably mm -hmm. was Metropolitan, it was Metropolitan Editor, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, did he respond when you, you said know, that? No, it was sort of like, you know, it's interesting. Um, it's hard, we can't, you know, the union won't talk to us. And I said, well, there are plenty of people that will tell you what's going on if you, you know, other times you accept people's uh, word for it. But no, it was, but I especially focused on the damage. I said, your readers see that. They say mm -hmm. millions of dollars worth of damage to the presses. And I said, this is the most propagandistic tool you can imagine. And people would, I mean, when you would encounter people who would talk to you about it, they'd say, well, but it caused all that damage to the presses. Mm. And uh, it, it really, you know, really was, uh, is, I mean, I think any, there were some reporters, <laughs> one a foreign, uh, assistant foreign editor, Dick Holman, who was out on strike, when he went back in, he posted a thing on the bulletin board saying, I'm back here at work, but I, uh, but I still oppose the post's abhorrent labor practices. Bradley just chewed him out royally. A lot of people who, uh, who went back in were, were not given an advantage. A few years later, I wrote a story for a defunct, now defunct journalism magazine called More, and uh, I interviewed one of the leaders of the faction that wanted to stay in all the time. And, and he said to me, well, I can't say that those of us who supported the strike were richly rewarded for our loyalty, nor can I say that people were punished. And he said, but, uh, but as he said, it's sort of the same old crap at the Post. I mean, uh, these are a lot of people always disgruntled at the Post, but uh, not, uh, uh, we had locally, the, the Star had one article on it. They didn't, the, the media was, Definitely a media blackout, uh, with the exception of something like this Channel 5 guy who seemed to report on it. I said if the Village Voice had been located in D.C., we might have had a better shot at it because columnists there, uh, Andrew Coburn, uh, Nat Hentoff, I'm trying to remember who else, another uh, columnist, might have been Jack Newfield, I'm not sure, all wrote sympathetic articles saying rampant careerism at the Washington Post, mm -hmm. uh, people, you know, no solidarity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Who are these people that, uh, and, and they were talking about a lot of their friends. Some of these were, were friends. I think Coburn especially had a number of friends there. Uh, did I have Stone write about the strike? I don't think he did. Uh, Sam Smith wrote a, a lot about it locally. Um, but his thing came out, you know, to a limited audience uh, once in a while. Um, it, but it was, you know, so that it was not the, the, the press's finest hour on this either. Um, anyway, uh, but there, but I, I think the, 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 the class divisions really uh, showed, I think, in this uh, strike, this notion that you know, they, these, these, these people did this to us and we're not, we're not going to support them. Uh, on that happy note, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, Is there anything else in that folder you want to show us um, to talk about? Uh, let's see. These, I mean, these were just all typical of a lot of things. In 1973, the Washington Post investigated the Watergate cover-up. 1976, who's going to invest the Washington Post cover-up? That was something from your committee. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. This uh, this was the this was after the this was done uh, like with with uh, Fred and uh, Chip and uh, and Sam. I think these these kind of things usually emanated there. But when the movie All the President's Men did show at the uh, Kennedy Center, and I had been in the newsroom when they were filming that. Uh, mm -hmm. My, I'm digressing again, but the only. The only conversation I had with one of the stars was Dustin Hoffman came up to me one day. I was an editor in, working inside, no tie on. I had this, and Hoffman goes over, he had sort of a flannel shirt and jeans, and he came over and he said, I have a question for you. Does Harry Rosenfeld, who was the Metropolitan Editor, get after you for not wearing a tie? And I said, of course, all the time he gets after me for a And I say, Harry, I'm just in here with you and all these other editors. I'm not trying to impress anybody. If I go out in the public, I'll put on a tie. But in here, I'm not going to wear one. I said, 
And Hoffman was very diligent in going through all the newspapers there, trying to see what was happening on the same day Woodward and Bernstein were reporting. So he had a sort of a picture of the whole world, what else was happening at the time. And I said, why, why do you ask? And he said, well, Harry gets after me for not wearing a tie. <laughs> and by God, a day or two later, he came in with still the same shirt and jeans that he had on a tie. <laughs> so anyway, so we're, we picketed there. And I, I don't remember even how many, several hundred people picketing. We didn't get awfully close. But Dugan and some of the others actually went inside the Kennedy Center and talked to people coming in saying, this is you know, a scab company that you may have appreciated what they did for Watergate. Uh, Dugan said he doesn't remember getting, you know, anybody trying to throw them out or anything. But the rest of us were at a distance chanting at all the people driving up and seeing the, uh, seeing the film, uh, which was a good film. Yeah, it was a good <laughs> Four <film>. stars. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's the, uh, my, my biggest, uh, I, I mean, I, I sometimes hate to show this, but my biggest claim to fame was an article in Esquire magazine by Richard Reeves, which he lumped me in with a lot of people that I didn't deserve to be lumped in with uh, as, as the last angry men, the <laughs> fearful price of bucking the system in America. And uh, he came to our house and took this really nice picture. But the way it describes our house, like we're living in this really <laughs> dump and don't have any money. <laughs> so, it was a really, really a nice article. But, uh, uh, but yeah, so let's see. These, there's, there's, a lot of these were typical things. Rally, April 16th. You can hold them up and yeah. I will zoom in. OK. Courts out of, what does it say? Labor disputes. Courts out of labor disputes. This was specifically addressed at the grand jury uh, investigation that went on and on for close to a year. And then, as I said, it, once the strike was released, I said, oh, all those felony charges disappeared, misdemeanors, uh, and um, okay. halfway house uh, in some cases. John, back to the Esquire article. Yeah. The, the subhead was paying the... The fearful price of bucking the system So do you feel like you paid a fearful price? Uh, or do no, you feel like no, you were liberated? No, I think, I mean, the thing, here was the thing, too, that I should say about Debbie. I, I should have said this earlier, that I said there's going to be a meeting of the Guild. This is when the, the first day of the strike. And I came back home, and I was seeing everybody else heading off to work, and I was feeling incredibly dejected. And often I came back and I said they voted not to support the strike. Most of the people are going back to work. Uh, I'm going to be staying out. She said, of course you're going to be staying out. And that was, as things got tougher financially, that was still the answer. I mean, forever. How long had you been married? At that point, we'd been married uh, a little over four years. Yeah. And we had these two kids who looked like one of them doesn't have any shoes in this picture. <laughs> Is it the poor kid we the couldn't, couldn't afford shoes? Yes, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it does talk. I mean, he he talked a, a, a little bit about the, the the finances of it all. And what uh, year was that? The this Esquire would have been seventy seven, I think. Okay. And um, so not very long afterwards. Yeah, and he started off. I mean, it was uh, interesting. Where I, I I just will read this because it casts puts a, f a former friend of mine in a bad light. <laughs> it says, hey, Dick, I asked my friend Richard Cohen, whatever happened to that guy Hanrahan? I don't know, he said. Did he go back to the post? No. Cohen obviously did not want to talk about John Hanrahan. They had been friends pretty close for a couple of years when they were ambitious young reporters covering Maryland politics together for the Washington Post. And then it goes on to say Cohen had gone to become a city-side reporter and columnist Hanrahan, assistant Maryland editor, and then they parted ways on October 1st, 1975. But uh, it was uh, various people. As I said, Carl Bernstein, that was the anecdote I always tell about Carl, is he borrowed a lot of records from me. We had a real mutual interest in records. And, uh, and I told somebody about this later, and they said, and you got them back? <laughs> and I said, yeah. 
He says, he never returns records. I said, oh, well, <laughs> I guess I lucked out on that or something. But uh, he, uh, or to give you an idea of his reputation pre-Watergate, when I, there was something I was doing one time, and Harry Rosenfeld, my nemesis, uh, said to me one day, I'd expect something like that from Bernstein, but not from you. So Carl was always on people's bad lists. He's a bad boy. I still remember when he wrote some article at a, at a commune, and I still remember the, the, the copy desk guy who was editing it just, ah, what is this drivel running in our papers, this goddamn Bernstein, you know, it's always like that. And, and, and I suppose, uh, you know, felt especially bad about him because his parents, in his own book, as he acknowledges, were were members of the Communist Party, had a labor background themselves, were uh, fiercely anti-labor, and were upset and embarrassed that he was uh, not supporting the, the strike. And, uh, and people, uh, who, mutual friends who had, Brent, the funny guy I talked about earlier, Brent Dillingham, encountered him maybe a year into the strike at some party. And Carl came up sort of real friendly to Brent and said, uh, hey, Brent, how's it going? What have you been up to? And Brent, who uh, relayed this, and I'm sure this is exactly what he said, oh, and he sort of puffed himself. Says, oh, I don't know, Carl. I've been out, uh, you know, supporting our, I believe you know John Hanrahan, a friend of ours who uh, used to work with you at the Post. You know, some people were out on strike. Other people were scabbing. How about you? <laughs> and, uh, uh, that was so... Uh, since we're, we don't have a thing on Brent, let me just tell a story. And then, I'm sorry, I've just Aww. kept it. But Brent, I happened to mention once I was reading this biography of Eugene Debs. And there was a story in there where Debs was in Terre Haute, Indiana. And uh, there was this friend and ally of his in town. I don't remember what his name was. I think he was an uh, attorney. But that one day uh, somebody... Uh, approached him and said uh, to this guy, can you, uh, can you contribute uh, $10 to uh, bury a policeman? And the guy said, here's 20, bury two of them. <laughs> so, I t so Brent, we're sitting in this bar <laughs> in Bethesda uh, after some, I think after going to some bluegrass concert. And, and uh, these two Montgomery County cops walk in to uh, order some sandwiches. And I won't go into all the details, but Brent was on their Montgomery County Police bad list for a long time. And anyway, Brent ran for sheriff. Of Brent Montgomery ran for sheriff. Yeah. He had shown that police were lying in a death penalty case. He had done a lot of different things. He'd been arrested for selling free press outside the Bethesda Police State. So he's sort of well known, but I don't think these cops know him. Brent's had a few drinks, 325, 350 pounds. He walks up between these two guys, or pushes, puts his arms around them and says, so help me. Let me tell you a story about Eugene Debs's friend. <laughs> and I thought, oh God, I'm going to have to bail him out or something. I think they realized he'd had a few drinks and just sort of, sort of, sort of gave him a funny look. And he came back and I said, Jesus, don't do that. Anyway, I'm way off topic. Sorry, uh, nothing else. To do, you have a, do you have another Brent Dillingham story you'd like to share? Because we didn't We get didn't to do anything Brent. on Brent. Um, do you well, remember? Here's, yeah. I mean, the thing, Brent. The, I mean, Brent uh, was my, my at the time when uh, my son was six years old. One of my sons said, "Is Brent Dillingham the funniest man in the world?" I mean, he could appeal to any level of <laughs> age because most of his jokes were sometimes at the six-year-old level. But he uh, he did uh, so many serious, important things. Uh, he got the uh, this guy that I mentioned, a guy named Joseph Kyles, was on. Death Row in Pennsylvania. He was a Montgomery County resident, uh, African American, uh, probably mixed race African American, who allegedly drove up to State College, Pennsylvania, where a former girlfriend of his lived, and murdered her. This is what he was convicted of in Pennsylvania. Capital crime. He was on death row. Brent, I don't even remember how he got involved in it, but began doing some uh, investigating. Uh, and part of the testimony, I mean, he said he wasn't in State College, didn't go up there, but two Montgomery County police said they 
knew him from some petty crimes he committed, and they said they were following his car on the Beltway. They saw his car on the Beltway, and they saw it turn off to uh, Interstate, whatever that is, 70, 70 I guess, to, which would head you up towards State College, this particular nine question, which would have given him time to get up there, kill her, and come back. Um, Brent subsequently got a hold of personnel records, timesheet records for these two guys. They weren't on duty that night. They found this after the, after the fact. Uh, then the prosecutor had to uh, backtrack and put one of them on the witness stand when they were having a, either a retrial or a hearing to, to dismiss the charges or something. Uh, and the guy said, well, he and his partner were sort of working off the books. They were just very diligent and sometimes they'd just go out. I mean, it was just a completely phony story. To make a long story short, it got him off death row and eventually got him out of prison. But once when Brent was, uh, and I interviewed the guy in prison and did his story, he was not a, he was not a, a friendly kind of guy. Brent didn't particularly like him personally, but he had a good relationship with him. And, and he said uh, that one time he was talking to him and he said, Dillingham. He said, you know, I've, we've been meeting for a long time. It just suddenly occurred to me, Dillingham, Dillingham, do you have any relatives that live out on Old Georgetown Road in Bethesda? And he said, yeah, my mother lives out there. And he said, I don't know if I should tell you this, but I, um, I work for a company that uh, called and harassed her to, for, because she was behind in her payments on her refrigerator or something. And Brett said, you were the guy who did that? <laughs> <laughs> this awful person. So it was sort of one of those coincidences uh, with him. But he, he uh, Maryland, there was the Patuxent Institute in Maryland, which was where they sent what they called um, defective delinquents, which meant that at a young age, it was sort of like pre-crime. You committed something, but your psychiatrist determined you were likely to commit more crimes. You could be held there indefinitely under that. Brent worked with a lot of people on that to get that declared unconstitutional in Maryland. They closed Patuxent down as that kind of a facility. I think they may have kept it open for, as a psychiatric institute or something. But, uh, I mean, there were many, many things. Uh, Indian, uh, Indian law issues. Uh, he worked for the Indian Law Resource Center. Um, he, uh, I, I, there, there are just so many uh, issues that in addition Brett to- Brett was married to an Indian, right? He was, yes, yeah. Ro Rosemary. Cornelius, yeah, who is now back out on the uh, reservation in uh, South Dakota. And uh, I mean, to give you an idea, I mean, this is so, and I won't mention names, but uh, Brent died of uh, leukemia in uh, 1990 at, a, at too young an age. And he, uh, he's in the hospital. This is probably less than a week before he died. and I came in there and he and Rosemary were just roaring with laughter about something. And I said, that oh, was so funny. And he said, well, uh, I was just telling Rosemary that of course she could get married to when, once I'm gone. I forget, he had probably some funny euphemism like once they put me six feet under, whatever he said. But, uh, but I told her that there were certain people she could marry and certain people she couldn't marry. <laughs> and and he said, now here's who she could marry. And he started naming some people. And I said, Brent, those are all really unpleasant people. He said, that's the idea. He said that she'll appreciate me so much more knowing that, you know, what she's missing. But if she marries, then he names some other people. If she marries so-and-so or so-and-so, I'll look very bad in comparison. <laughs> and uh, he... Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, he was just, uh, in, in Chicago, Debbie said that at the 68 convention, he's facing down the, um, not facing down, there's the National Guard people, though, saying that with rifles, young 19-year-old guys, and, and Brent just cracking jokes to them, trying to get them to respond in some way and saying, do you know the difference between the Boy Scouts and the National Guard? <laughs> One guy sort of like this and said, well, the Boy Scouts have adult supervision. <laughs> I mean, he just, uh, uh, but his activism, I mean, it was just, I mean, there, there is this thing that I want to get that was in the uh, file of this woman, Eddie Becker knows, which was a list from the police files of 
the 150 most dangerous, I don't know how they've been called most dangerous, most serious organizers of May Day. And Brent was in there, um, you know, place of honor in there. Uh, he was just, uh, and, he, and his brother, John, was also very much an actor. John would always show up in the same black suit every place. He looked completely, like I said, like this. 15th century cardinal standing against all these demonstrators. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, there's so much. I, I wasn't really thinking of talking that much about Brent, but I, uh, I'd have to really uh, come up with some things. But I mean, he, oh, this, this is nothing, very little to do with activism, but he, uh, we were in the Shamrock Bar in Georgetown, Bluegrass place where the country gentleman played all the time in the 60s and early 70s. And it was really a, always an interesting conglomeration of people in there. There'd be college students, there'd be motorcycle people, there'd be activists, there'd be just a lot of people who enjoyed the bluegrass. And uh, one time we got up, and I think his sisters were there, and two or three other people, we got up on the table and we started going out and I said to one of his sisters, where's Brent? And he came on and said, ah, some guy got up and punched me. I said, do you know why? And he said, no, no, I don't. I have no idea. So that incident passed. About a, a year later, he's in some diner, another diner in Bethesda that doesn't exist anymore. And uh, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and this guy's sitting down at the end of the bar, and a couple of other guys have come in and are harassing this guy sitting at the bar, and are literally like, Brent thinks he's gonna, they're going to hurt him in some way. And Brent had said so big, that was just his presence was he said once what he called himself a heavy revolutionary when they tried to <laughs> move him from the street, that uh, he walked up to them and, and said, some, some trouble going on here? What's, what's happening? And the guy sort of melted away, quit harassing the guy, left. And then the, the guy sitting there at the, in the, at the, on the stool said, you don't remember me, do you? And he said, no. He said, I punched you. <laughs> And he said, I don't know why I did it at the Shamrock. I don't know why I did it, but I want to thank you for what you just did. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, uh, as I said, that has nothing to do with activism, but it was just sort of uh, indicative of, of how he, I mean, he did, he, he would stick up for people. He would, uh, he had, uh, I mean, I knew him, uh, Debbie was working with him at Compeers, an organization he started in D.C and uh, then uh, developed Freedom House in Bethesda, which was uh, sort of a ha haven and, and discussion place for uh, high school uh, kids. And um, anyway, I'm keeping everybody here too long. I, no, I you're not. Thank about, you yeah. so much, John. And we can do this a second time. With Brent. We know we haven't heard all your stories about Brent. lots of things. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.